Hello and welcome. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us tonight for our insight into finance, investment and beyond. Um, I think it's going to be a really, really exciting evening. We've got four fantastic speakers lined up, all at very different stages of their careers, um, all of whom are very strong association with the school. Um, and after our four speakers have presented um, their careers and their thoughts and views, we've got um, Kerry Chisnell, who is one of our careers teachers, who's also uh, the head of subject of economics in our school. And she's going to talk a little bit about a few courses that are, are of interest and are available. So our four speakers are, um, I'll say a little bit, a bit about each one before they speak, but we have Sejal, who recently left Manchester High, um, so I remember her very well. Um, and she's currently studying at university. And um, we then have Jordana, who left a few years ago um, and um, is working in um, worked in um, investment banking and is now an infrastructure private debt fund um, uh, associate. We then have um, Alex uh, Lloyden, who left quite a few years before that, um, and she's a private client director. And finally, we have Sarah Bates. Um, who's a non-executive director and trustee chair and a former investment manager. So very, very different stages in, of career and experiences. But without further ado, I would like to hand over now to our first speaker, Sejal. Hi everyone, um, I hope you're all well. I'm so excited to be back here. I think I was just thinking um, earlier today actually that um, I think I was the last class uh, that left Manchester High before the pandemic started. So I was the last class at where we took our A-levels um, where pandemic and, and lockdown were kind of things out of sci-fi movies and things like that. So it's great, it's great to be back and I'm really excited. Um, I guess over the last few years, um, I've learned a lot about my career and I've been on kind of a, a, a career journey. And I guess that's what I'm here to speak to you guys about today. But maybe first I could just um, talk a bit about my life at Manchester High. So uh, if we could just go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, I joined Manchester High when I was in year four, so in 2010. I absolutely loved my time at the school. Um, I was an active member of so many different clubs from Young Enterprise. Um, I was editor of the school magazine Onward, and I was quite a large part of the, the music community as well. So I was in wind band and choir, and I kind of helped out on a few of the school productions as well in music wise. Um, and yeah, so for my GCSEs, I did the three sciences, geography, Spanish, music and further maths. I guess the reason why I did geography and then why I then took it for my A-levels as well is because I've always been a big believer in doing what I enjoy. Um, and geography was one of my favourite subjects before GCSE. And so I decided to, to take that for GCSE and then for A-level. And the same goes for maths as well, really. I guess between my GCSEs and A-levels, that kind of long summer holiday that you have, I started to to look into various different career paths. I did so much work experience in various different fields and realised that finance and economics was something that I found really exciting. And I decided to take that for my A-levels as well and um, was definitely something I really, really enjoyed. Um, and the highlight of my time at Manchester High was definitely the Disneyland Paris trip. Um, if any of you were to ask Miss Chisnell about that, then I'm sure she'll have lots of stories to tell because it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, next slide, please. So um, since leaving Manchester High, I decided again, you know, I really enjoyed economics, so I thought I would study that further. And I'm currently in my final year at the University of Nottingham studying economics. Um, aside from my degree at Nottingham, I've been a large part of lots of different societies. I think the major thing is that I'm currently chairwoman of the corporate finance team, which is essentially the investment banking division of the Econ and Finance Society here. And that's really exciting. But um, I'm also part of a few other cultural societies like Indian Dance Society, Hindu Society and Asian Society as well. Um, so on the next slide is um, just my timetable. It looks it looks quite empty, my timetable um, currently, but I guess the whole point of university is that a lot of it is self-study as well. So while we have lectures, all of the spare space that you see, um, I spend a lot of time doing kind of the additional reading or re-watching some of the lectures if there was anything that I um, didn't understand and things like that as well. Um, and so yeah, next slide please. 
So um, now I'm going to just talk a bit about the finance industry um, in general. When I was in your guys' shoes, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I had absolutely no idea. I just knew that I enjoyed economics and I, I enjoyed the idea of going into finance. Um, the first thing that I did was kind of research a variety of different jobs that were available in the industry um, that I've listed here on the slide. And for any of you that are feeling lost but want to research into this industry in, in general, I would my first piece of advice would be maybe if you get access to this slide later to just kind of put these terms into Google and, and read about them and see if you find any of them interesting um, enough. So um, I, I did this and I came across investment banking and that was something that appealed to me. And that's what I then decided to, to kind of look into a bit further um, and take that on board. So uh, if we go on to the next slide. Um, for those of you that might want to just know what investment banking is all about, I thought I would just give a very, very brief overview. Um, so essentially, you all know that there are lots of companies out there, any company that you might buy from, um, but companies require money to, to grow and, and, to, and to essentially be the big companies that they want to be. And um, one way of getting the money they need to be able to grow is from investors. And this is essentially those people that have the money that they can put into these companies. So an investment bank is essentially the middleman between the investors and between the companies, and they kind of match them together. Um, companies can grow... Uh, through a variety of ways, they can either buy out another company, and that's called um, that's known as an M and A transaction or merger and acquisition, um, or um, they can raise capital via debt or equity. I'm going to go into this further, and it's it can get quite technical, and I don't want to get too technical today. Um, but that's kind of a high level overview. And just in terms of the job hierarchy as well, for those of you that are wondering, you would kind of start off as an analyst and then in three years move up to associate, then vice president, then director and then managing director or MD. So um, next slide, please. Um, so just a kind of a typical structure of an investment bank. So some of you might have heard of JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs. Um, they generally look like this as their structure. They have their investment banking division itself, which I'm going to talk a bit more about in a second. But they also have um, their markets division. So uh, for any of you that might have watched several different movies or, for example, you know, heard about stockbrokers, this is your traditional kind of stockbrokers um, in their markets division. They also have a research division where they kind of produce research reports about about um, various different companies. And as well as that, they have lots of other divisions as well. And at the end of the day, investment banks, they are companies, so they require their management, finance and administration departments as well. Uh, next slide. So um, I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, the three main investment banking divisions. So on the last slide, obviously, um, I showed that massive box that was the investment banking division. But inside of that itself, um, there are subdivisions. And this is where I've taken interest and this is where I've kind of been focusing on over the last few years while I've been at university. So um, there are lots and lots of different teams, uh, but the three main divisions inside an investment banking division um, are debt capital markets, equity capital markets and mergers and acquisitions. I'll start with mergers and acquisitions because that's my personal favourite. I think um, I always think about the time when Ms Chisnell gave us this topic in economics and that was where I first uh, found out about mergers and acquisitions and I kind of took that on board since then. So it's definitely my most favourite division. Um, essentially, as I talked about before, if one company were to buy another company, um, that's known as an acquisition. Uh, I've got an example here. So most of you will know about Disney and 21st Century Fox as well. So Disney recently acquired 21st Century Fox um, and um, they bought it for $71.3 billion. The great thing about these deals is that now Disney essentially has the name for a lot of 21st Century Fox's films. So X-Men, Fantastic Four, Mrs. Doubtfire, a lot of a lot of films that you guys have probably seen. Um, and so that's what happens in M&A transaction. They, they essentially own the, the company that they've bought out. Um, the other two types of divisions are the capital markets. Uh, again, I don't want to get too technical today. Uh, these are all things that I learned when I got to university, by the way. So if none of this makes any sense, then I honestly wouldn't worry because I didn't know any of this when I was at school. Um, but I 
just thought I would include it for those of you that might be interested. Um, but if we started off with the debt capital markets, I guess if you were to take, if you were to borrow money from your parents today um, and promise to pay it back in the future, um, maybe a bit excess on top because obviously your parents are helping you out here, so they might ask you to pay a bit excess on top, then essentially you're taking on debt because you're borrowing money with a promise to pay it back in the future. Um, Similarly, um, companies can can do the same thing. Uh, so, for example, Qatar Petroleum, they wanted to borrow about twelve point five billion dollars. Um, and so this was to essentially boost production. So they the DCM um, division of of the investment bank that they were with helped them to raise this money from investors. So investors who are willing to give up their money to Qatar Petroleum um, with a promise that they were going to get the money back in the future. Um, equity capital market. So equity is a bit more complicated. It's essentially the total value of a company to its shareholders. So you might invest in a company today and you'll be their shareholder and you'll be part of that equity as well. Um, if a company wants to, to issue this equity for the first time, they might go through something quite called an initial public offering. Again, quite technical, I'm not going to talk any further about it, but the investment banks help them to, to go through this process. So some of you might drink Oatly um, or have seen it in supermarkets as essentially an oat milk. And um, they issued equity for the first time uh, last year, I think. And an interesting fact, I guess, is that the reason why they wanted to do this is because they wanted to open one of the world's biggest plant-based dairy factories in the UK. Um, I guess this is a growing trend at the moment as well. So that's kind of a very high level overview of, of an investment bank. Um, so if we could just go on to the next slide, please. So I'm, I'm going to talk a bit more about myself now and what the journey that I've been on for my career over the last three years. Um, it very much started when I came to university and I joined the corporate finance team, as I mentioned before. Um, I started off as a team member and over the last few years I've been on the committee. But I guess in my first year, this is where I learned a lot about a path into investment banking. Um, this, the path that I've taken, as you'll see on the slide, is becoming increasingly common. It's not, you don't have to do this path, but it's becoming increasingly common because the investment banking um, uh, industry itself has become increasingly competitive over the last few years. And so um, a lot of people go through the route that I've taken. I started off doing Spring Insight Weeks. Um, spring Weeks are essentially a one week internship at a firm where they give you a very high level overview of the different operations of the firm. So one day might be about investment banking, the next day might be about their, their markets division. So I did um, Insight Weeks at JP Morgan, Credit Suisse and UBS, all investment banks. Um, I then managed to convert my Credit Suisse Spring Insight Week into a summer internship uh, that I just did this summer. It was a 10 week long summer internship. Unfortunately, all virtual this year so I wasn't able to go down to London um, like some of the other banks had but it was it, essentially I was working on the multi-billion dollar transactions that the bank is doing I was contributing to that I was in the mergers and acquisitions team as well it was very exciting I really enjoyed it I realized that I wanted to do mergers and acquisitions in particular for um, a job um, so now I have a job that I'll be starting in a few months at Evercore which is another investment bank and it specializes in mergers and acquisitions as well um, so I'm excited to start that the um, after I finish my degree in a, in a few months time. So um, if we go on to the next slide, I thought some of you might want to see what a day in my life looked like as um, an analyst this summer. Um, it was very, very busy and um, definitely, definitely something that I rewarded myself with a long break afterwards, but I did enjoy it. It's constantly moving. Um, one thing that you might see down the side is the times. The times can be quite long, but I guess that's because the nature of the work is such that you're working on such high level deals and there's always work coming in, coming out. So um, as you can see here, this was a theoretical day in the life. So I would start on maybe one project. I would have so many different calls with so many different people in the morning and um, constantly getting feedback on my work, making changes. Um, then I might have a short lunch break. And then in the afternoon, I had something called a management presentation, which is where essentially Essentially, we're helping the company that is being sold to present itself to potential clients. So, um, you know, that this would be a two hour long call. And my job as an intern was to make 
uh, thorough notes during this call, which I then circulate around to the rest of the team afterwards. Um, I kind of gained quite a good reputation for doing this, to be fair. And all of the people on my team really enjoyed um, it when I made these notes. So I got asked to attend so many of these presentations throughout the whole course of my internship because everyone just wanted to, to read my notes, I guess, at the end. Um, so this was kind of a regular thing that I did um, many times a week. Um, and yeah, so I guess then, then we move on to the, the rest of the day where maybe at about 6 p.m. Uh, another analyst in the team would ask me for help on another project they were working on. So I'd start, so I'd drop project one, I'd start on project two. Um, I'd then work on to project two way into the night, but then project one might have a meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. So once I'd finished project two, I'd obviously have to go back to project one and finish that and submit it so it's ready for the 9 a.m. meeting with the client tomorrow. Um, so this, I guess, was a, a longish day, which was not uncommon, but definitely fun. And it definitely gave me such a good experience of working on so many different deals um, in so many different industries. So in my internship, I worked on in the healthcare industry, in the technology industry, chemicals, um, well, it's consumer retail. So I, I got quite a, a broad range of experience in so many different industries and every industry has different niches about it as well. So definitely very exciting, would highly recommend. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. Um, you might be interested in what type of person would be most suited to the industry. And uh, frankly, the, the answer is that anyone and everyone is suited to the industry. It, as I've shown before, it's such a vast, there is such a vast range of jobs that you can do anything and you can find your position. Um, I think the biggest thing, though, is that if you're interested in, for example, investment banking, where you're working very long hours, um, what people like to see is someone that they would definitely like to work with. So someone that's enthusiastic, someone that's fun and confident and loves to work as a team um, or loves to work with other people so that's definitely the most important one um yeah next slide so just lastly i wanted to give you a few of my top tips um i know that as i've said many times already it can be quite daunting if, especially because if you don't know about where you feel would be best for you in the industry so the first thing is to do your research as i mentioned at the start if you take all of those boxes and type them into google and work out what sounds interesting to you to you and then you might decide you want to do a bit of work experience in those fields and then you might realize that actually it's, it's not the thing for you and you might want to try something else instead um and then um yeah so I guess another thing is that it's a very competitive world so don't be afraid of rejection um when you're applying to things like the spring weeks you might get rejected several times before you you get an offer at the end but it's worth it because if you're interested in it then at the end of the day you will as a, as a Manchester high girl you're going to get an offer you, it, you might just get rejected a few times like I did before you get the offer in the end um and once you're at university, I would recommend getting yourself involved in all of the finance and economic societies. This was definitely really helpful for me because especially when I was in first year, I made really good friends with the people in the years above me um, who had been through the internship process. So even today, they're now working in the city, they're now working in London. So I reach out to them all the time and ask them about so many different questions. I, I constantly get so I constantly have so many questions to ask. Um, and it's so useful to have that network. The industry is it's, it's really big, but it's also very small. So you'll always come across the same people over and over again. Um, and if you want to expand your network, a really good account to make is on LinkedIn. Um, this is where you can kind of connect with so many different employees. Maybe you could organize a call with people um, if you want to learn more about the work that they do as well. So I, I definitely give you that top tip. Um, but yeah, that's about the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop speaking now because what you're going to find in a second is that the other three speakers are a lot more knowledgeable and a lot more experienced than I am, can probably say a lot more than I can about the, the industry. Um, and I'm actually very excited to learn from them about what they have to say as well. So I think I'll let them speak now. But yeah, thank you. Well, gosh, I'm exhausted after that. That's fantastic, Sage. I was looking at that schedule because I think I work quite long hours, nine until 2 a.m. Gosh, that's a really, really long day. I'm assuming that's not every day, but but you never know. Um, but I, I'd just like to say that Sage, I'll sort of typify what we what we might call a kind of typical man high girl, the enthusiasm, um, the ambition, sense of being a self starter self-assured but also modest and willing to learn from other people and it's that and you can be any personality type to be in this industry as she said but it's those sort of attributes that I think are really important but of course any personality type 
you might be a slightly shy, a slightly more reserved person, but you can still have your LinkedIn profile and you can still do all of these networking things. Um, so I definitely think that there's a huge amount um, to take from what's, what uh, Sejal's just told us. And of course, she's still at university, but congratulations, Sejal, on securing a job, um, which is brilliant. Um, coming out of straight out of university into what is obviously a very prestigious job. So well done. And I think there's a lot that our listeners can hopefully kind of learn from the way that you've approached this, which is no different to actually the way you approach things when you're at school. So I'm pleased that you're enjoying it. Um, and it looks like you've done loads of different things and contributed well to the university, as well as you getting a lot out of that university. So I'd like to now move seamlessly on to our next speaker. Before I do, actually, I should have said at the start, apologies for not mentioning, we do have a, ch we do have, um, a chat function where you can ask um, questions. So if you post your questions in there, um, if you just click, click on the little um, speech bubbles at the top of your screen on, on your screen somewhere, you put any questions in there and at the end of all the speakers, before we come to the career section, um, well, I'll feed some of those questions to our presenters so we'll get those answered. Uh, 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 throughout the course of the evening. So I'd like to now introduce our second speaker um, who graduated from our, us and who left our school a few years before uh, Sejal. And she um, has in fact worked in investment banking, as I mentioned. So some of what Sejal said is possibly familiar and she may be going to develop that. And she now currently works in private debt. So that's a different a different arm, something that was touched upon there. But we're going to hear so many different um, areas of this particular career. Um, and before I just move on to our next speaker, the other thing just to say is that Sejal obviously did, is doing an economics degree, but there'll be those of you out there that may not be wanting to do necessarily a pure economics degree. We'll hear about this later, but you can do business degrees, finance degrees, management degrees, other degrees not actually related specifically to this and still go into this area of work. So there'll be people who have done degrees in very different subjects who can move into this kind of finance uh, uh, profession if that's what they choose to do. So I will now um, hand over to uh, Zordana and I'm really looking forward to hearing her presentation. So over to you and thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. H hi everyone. Th thanks so much for, for inviting me to talk. Um, so, so if we move to the, the first slide. Thank you. So, so I left school in, in 2012. Um, and I'm currently working in an infrastructure debt fund. And most of you are probably wondering what is an infrastructure debt fund? So simply what I do is I invest in infrastructure. So I invest in wind farms, solar farms, schools, hospitals, and, I, and I'll go into a bit more detail about that later on in the presentation. So, so first of all, what, what I'd like to cover in the presentation is uh, my, my time at Manchester High. Um, and how that led me then to, to civil engineering um, in university rather than, than finance. What I did after uni and, and my career um, and, and what it actually means to be um, to work in an infrastructure debt fund in a typical day. And then tips I've, I've gathered, gathered over the last uh, couple of years. So if we move to the, the next slide, please. Thank you. So. I'm going to go through a bit about my, my time at Manchester High. Um, and so this is me on my first day in year five. Uh, you can see my uniform is way too big for me. Um, and in terms of the, the subjects which I, I studied at school, so I did double science, French, uh, German art and history, and I did uh, the, the usual uh, subjects. And then for A-levels, I did maths, further maths, physics, and then I also did chemistry for, for AS. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do at, at GCSE level or maybe really at A level, um, but I just chose the subjects which I, I really enjoyed. And, and thinking back to, to school, there, there were some things that I, I really learned from school and, and, um, and, and one of them I just want to um, talk about is, is worth e work ethic. So Manhai instilled in me a, a really strong work ethic. And um, my job, as, as a lot of other jobs in, in finance, are, are very demanding. Um, and so I think that's really helped me manage, you know, to, to keep up with that and, and work hard. Um, and I also think Manhai made me a more rounded person. So, so at Manhai, I did uh, water polo, drama, organised Jewish events, and it really built my confidence and, and, and made me more, more rounded. So moving to the, the next slide, please. 
so after school, um, I did a, a gap year in Israel, um, and then I went to study civil engineering at Imperial College in, in London. Um, and civil engineering is, is it's the design and the construction of, of infrastructure, of, of buildings, of bridges, etc. And, and the reason why I did civil engineering, um, there's a couple reasons. So, so one of them, um, so you can see the Beetham Tower in the left hand side of, of this slide. So I always wondered how how the Beetham Tower stood up. You know, it's got a cantilever coming out. And um, so how that was possible and, and studying civil engineering, obviously, I, I would learn that. Um, also, I did an internship in, in year 11 um, in civil engineering and, and they were building a school. Um, and what I really liked is the work you put in, you could actually see in real life the, the outcome. Um, and also, I, I was also interested in accountancy. Um, my dad is an accountant, so I was very exposed to, to what an accountant does. And I knew if I if I studied civil engineering at university, I could definitely then go on and, and do accountancy as a job. It wouldn't make a difference. Um, but if I did study accountancy at university, I might not necessarily be able, it'd be much harder to become a civil engineer. Um, so if we if we move to the, the next slide, please. Um, so so just uh, touching on my career path. So so while I was studying at university uh, civil engineering, um, I, I did an internship at, at Waterman's, which is a civil engineering engineering firm. I really enjoyed the internship. Um, engineering is very, very collaborative. Uh, you see what you're designing in, in real life, which is uh, I find that very exciting. Um, however, I, I wanted something that would just push me uh, a bit more. I didn't I didn't really want the nine to five job. I wanted something w working longer hours, as, as Seja mentioned before. Um, so then I applied um, for an internship in, in sales and trading at, at Goldman Sachs. Um, I did that because I'm, I'm quite mathsy and everyone told me, you know, if you, if you like maths, you know, why don't you go try out sales and trading? Um, and, and Goldman Sachs is um, a very large investment bank. Um, and what, what really they do in the sales and trading division is they simply buy and sell financial products for clients. And um, I found it super exciting, you know, being on the trading floor, a lot of energy and um, definitely more intense than, than engineering. Uh, but decided it wasn't really for me. Um, it was very, very fast paced, maybe a bit too fast for me. Um, sometimes a bit more big picture. I like I like to, you know, look at all the details um, and it was a bit more independent. So when you do the trades, a lot of the time it, it's you doing them. It's, it's less collaborative. Um, and, and the thing I, I didn't really like that I, I found was quite difficult was waking up at 5 30 a.m every morning so um so then i, I decided uh, i i decided okay I'm, I'm not sure what i want to do now so i started speaking around looking for different um different careers um and and when speaking to people i found that i like the sound of, of investment banking um so i applied for an internship at, at hsbc um, and and what banking is in simple terms investment banking um, is just advising on a, a financial tra transaction. And um, at HSBC, I worked in the infrastructure department. So that for me linked very well with civil engineering. So I, I stayed still in the infrastructure sector. And, and just to give you an example of what I did there. So uh, one of the projects I worked on, um, a client uh, wanted to expand an airport and they needed billions of, of dollars of pounds to do this. So the question is, is where can they get that money from? How do they raise that money? And then how do they pay it back? Um, so, so that's something that, you know, we analysed and we prepared the work for the client to enable them to, to do that. Um, so I, I did an internship and then I, I did the graduate programme at HSBC. And then um, in May last year, I moved to Edmunds Rothschild, which is a, um, an infrastructure debt fund. So instead of advising on, you know, where to get the money from, um, in, in Edmund Rothschild, we essentially give the money uh, to invest in, in, in infrastructure. Um, so I think looking at this, I've, I've just to summarise this, this slide, I think, you know, I've had a bit of a journey 
going through engineering to finance, uh, going through trying out different companies. Um, and I think it's very important to, to see what you like and what you don't like to, to find what, what you want to do. And, and moving to the, the next slide, please. So, so just to go through um, a, a typical day of, of, of what I do. Um, so the main thing which I focus on is analysing and understanding what we're actually investing in. And these are just some, on this slide, there's just some pictures of all the different things that we invest in. Um, I think one of the interesting things are the electric vehicle charging points. I think it's very topical and really exciting and new. Um, and some other ones, you know, solar farms, wind farms, airports. And, and something else we, we, we do, which is very different to, to the analysis, is uh, we'd fundraise. So the question is, wh where do we get our money from? So people and company give us the money and then we choose what invest, what infrastructure to invest it in. And um, so we, we need to go to these companies and, and I essentially ask them for, for their money. So we present to them about what we do. And then another portion of my day is, is working on financial models. So these are essentially huge Excel um, spreadsheets with a lot of different lines and tabs. And essentially they contain all the finances for a transaction, money coming in, money coming out. So, so my day is quite, is quite diverse, I would say. I think also just moving to, to why I like um, why I really like working in the infrastructure debt fund. So I think the first thing is you, you can see what you're investing in. So, you know, it, it's real life. So, for example, uh, fiber and um, the way I'm connected to this to this call is, is through Internet, which is which is connected through, through fiber to the home. And for example, my, my company could have financed that. Um, I think an, another reason as well that I, I really like finance is it gives you uh, financial independence, which I think typically finance does pay better than than other other jobs. And this is something I didn't consider when when I was younger. It wasn't really on my radar. But I do hear now other people saying, "Oh, I wish it was just you know a factor when they were considering jobs." So I, I think that's just something to to also think about. Um, and and something else is I I really take pride in in the work I do because. Um, I really care about the environment and, and the, the job I'm in um, is very positive on the environment. We, we, we invest in oil. No, we do not invest in oil and gas. Sorry, we, we don't invest in oil and gas. We only invest in, you know, renewables, things that have a positive effect on the environment. And, and also every time we, we do invest in, in some of these assets, a lot of jobs are, are created from it. Um, and, and moving to the, the next slide. Yeah. So, so just some um, uh, top tips, which just some tips I've, I've learned over the years. Um, I think work experience um, is, is really important. I, I've done um, qu quite a few different internships and, and really you understand what you like, what you don't like and what really suits you. Also, th there's no such thing as a silly question always ask the questions which um, which you have, the question that you're probably thinking someone else is probably thinking as well. Um, speak to as, as many people as you can about their careers just to get a bit of exposure to, to what is out there and what different careers are, are op what, what are the options to you. Um, and I also think taking small calculated risks um, in your career is, is important. Um, for me, I, I really loved HSBC and um, moving to Edmunds or Rothschild was, was a risk for me. Was I leaving a job where I was very comfortable uh, in to, you know, the unknown and, and it, it paid off. Um, and then uh, the, the, the final tip is, is careers aren't linear. So you can study English, history and then go into finance. Um, I mean, the, the banks or, or and, and finance accounting or any any uh, job in finance, they're not necessarily looking for an economic student. They're looking for a range of different students. Um, so I think and then moving to the, the next slide. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me.
atención. Brilliant, lovely. Thank you so much, Diana. That was really, really fascinating. And I like the way that um, you talked about the different parts to your career, the different moves that you've made and why you've made them. And the, the idea of staying sort of true to your ethics and your values, because in other um, insight interviews we've had, people have also talked about that, that you need to do something that sort of m matches with your or mirrors your kind of values and your ethics. Um, and sometimes people ask, for example, the question about salaries and things like that. So I think it's really good that you articulated that actually, yes, the finance sector is generally quite well paid, um, but the work that you do is very valuable work and you can choose within that how you want to focus yourself. Um, and that's why we enjoy doing these presentations, because students find out about all sorts of different careers, different pathways to those careers, but also the realities of, of the job itself. and. Um, you know, the lifestyle that comes along with that. So it's really, really useful information. Um, and just to reiterate, you know, your, your degree obviously was in civil engineering. It wasn't in finance, but it's equally possible that somebody could do a, de a degree in something entirely different again and still go into this sector. Um, and that's important, I think, for young people to hear, because I think when you're starting out thinking about what GCSEs, what A-levels, what degree, we're quite linear in the way that we think and the way we gather information. So it's important to realise that one thing doesn't automatically have to lead to the other, um, that there are different ways to approach things. So that's fa that's fantastic. And I like the very different, um, two different, very, very different presentations that we've had. But I can see Sage are equally work going into work in an industry such as the one you have worked in or are currently working in. So there's a really nice kind of smooth trajectory there. So thank you so much. So that was really, really interesting. Um, and I'm going to move on to our next speaker now. So Alex. Um, who's actually a private client director and she's going to talk to us about her trajectory and possibly her time at Manchester High as well. I'm not sure, I haven't seen her slides um, in detail yet, but I'm looking forward to hearing this uh, presentation. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Alex. Sarah, thank you very much and good evening everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, my, my name's Alex Lloyden. Um, I am currently a director responsible for delivery of investment solutions essentially to a financial sales team. So what does that mean? Well, I'm really glad Sejal was able to show you the structure um, of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a bank um, or, or of a financial services institution because I work in the wealth management square. So slightly different to Jordana and Sejal, um, I, I'm in that wealth management sphere um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. But I, if we could move on to the first slide, please, and I can tell you a little bit about um, my, my life at, at Manchester High. Before I do, um, just to say I, I, I did grow up locally, um, so I, I grew up in, in, in Aldley Edge and I moved to London um, when, I, when I started working. So I live in London now with, with my husband and my seven year old daughter. I am single parenting tonight, so I do apologise if there's a there's a little face appears. Um, she's um, she's just watching the television downstairs, so um, she uh, she may appear. Um, but um, just sort of focusing on um, life at Manchester High. So I started. Um, Manchester High at year seven. So I joined when I was 11 um, in 1991, many, many years ago. Um, and I stayed through right through to my A-levels. So I, I guess really I'll start in year nine when I was sort of making my GCSE selection um, or, 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 or making those decisions. The reality is I didn't really have a very firm view on what I wanted to do. Um, I'd certainly had no idea what financial services was. Um, you know, growing up in the north of England, it's not something a lot of your parents tend to do. Um, or, or wasn't when I was at school. Um, there weren't many people in, in financial services. There were lots of lawyers and there were lots of doctors and I didn't like science. So I quite liked um, the arts and, and law seemed to be um, the sort of the, 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 the preferred route. Um, and so I started thinking about sort of law um, that informed my, my decision to do history, English and economics. But really to Sajel's points, and I think Jordana drew, drew it out as well, it's just I chose them because I enjoyed them. They were subjects I was interested in um, and they were the, what I wanted to do. Um, and so I didn't pick them, um, you know, sort of just because I wanted to do to do law. I picked them because I was interested in them. Um, and I'd also been told that languages were really difficult at A-level. So a bit of a cop out, really. I, I should have done Spanish at school, but I didn't uh, because I, I was told it would be a real, real step up from GCSE. Um, 
the reality um, was that it didn't, didn't really matter. Um, but the best advice I was given uh, by a careers teacher at Manchester High was, Alex, if I were you, I wouldn't do a law degree. Um, and the reason they, 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 they said that to me was, one, um, I... I'm not, I was never really the most studious bookworm at school, if I'm being perfectly honest, and I'll, I'll tell you about sort of why and why that. And um, they said, just do something that will interest you. You will get bored doing a law degree. Um, and, and that was a careers teacher who had also taught me um, going through the school. So she knew me pretty well. Um, and it was really, really great advice. She said, even, you know, you can still go into law, you can go into anything, you don't need to do law to do it. And, and I, I'd, I'd like to just draw on um, the couple of points that Sajal and Jordana made about the beauty and the attraction of financial services is you can literally study anything you like um, and there will be a place for you in the financial services industry somewhere. Um, in fact, that's what I love about the industry is just the diversity um, of, 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 of people that, that, I, that I come across. So great advice from my careers teacher, don't study law. And the other thing, she said, you're not going to get straight A's. And I didn't get straight A's. She said, so you're not going to end up at the university you want to end up at. So go and do something you're going to enjoy um, that, 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 um, that you know, will, will enable you to get to the university you want to get to. Great. Extracurricular wise at, 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 um, at Manchester High, I did a lot of swimming. So I did a lot of swimming outside of school and I did it to a national level. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why sort of study came secondary, because sport was really my number one passion passion um, and I did a lot of it. Um, I was heavily involved with Young Enterprise. We were just talking earlier. Um, we did it with Manchester Grammar in those days. So we had a joint Young Enterprise um, and it was great fun. Um, and also in the late 90s, there was a lot of activity um, in terms of, you know, sort of political activity, both in the UK, but um, more broadly, I was particularly interested in what was going on in South South America at the time. Um, and I, I, I sort of got involved in some of the young political groups outside of, uh, of, of school and really enjoyed it. So that sort of informed um, my, my decision to sort of decide to study what I studied at university. What were the best bits of Manchester High? Well, I've put on here, I don't know, I, I know the Roy McCarthy bus still runs. I'm not sure whether it's in conjunction with Manchester Grammar anymore, but they were the best hours of the day, the bus journey to school and the bus journey home. Um, uh, you know, meeting my friends, um, and, and you'll see here a, a picture of, of, of me in, um, that will have probably been in about 96. That was as we were finishing for GCSEs with Mrs Jenkins right in the middle, um, who was an English teacher. Um, um, I think until not, I don't think she left too long ago. So some of you might remember her. I can't remember that she changed her name, actually, because she, she may have got remarried. Anyway, um, she was our form teacher. And, and actually, probably 40% of the girls in this class are still my closest network. Um, you know, they are my confidants. Um, they are the girls, the people that pick me up when I'm flat on my back. They're the ones that take me out and celebrate when things are going well. Um, so so what I would say is, you know, even having gone through university um, and then sort of moving into professional life, these are the rocks I turn to. Um, and, and I suspect maybe Jordan is in, in a similar position. And, and, and the girls that you're sitting next to today um, will probably feature in your life for many years to come. Um, and indeed, one of these is, is my daughter's godmother. So, you know, it's it, it, that's what Manchester High breeds. And, and, and Jordana mentioned that this strong work ethic, it's the solidity of friendships that you make. It's all of these incredible talents that you probably don't realise are being instilled into you or characteristics or or um, elements of you that, that are being built um, whilst you're, you're, you know, at Manchester High. The influences that um, that you, you you are under and take with you into 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 later life. Um, any regrets? The only regret was not taking Spanish A level when I should have. But if we can move on to the next slide. Um, the, the one the one thing, um, if, if I was just to summarise the time at Manchester High and that slide was just back to the point that Sejal made around do what you want, do what you're interested in, study what you enjoy. Um, as I said, the, the finance industry is is, is, is hugely, um, hugely wide and, and welcomes people from all, all, all walks of life and all different backgrounds. So do do what you enjoy now. So life after Manchester High, um, I took a gap year. I did Spanish A level. I worked in a bar. Um, uh, my mum and dad were like, oh, God, um, you know, you, you need to get to, to university. Um, so I applied in, applied again in my gap year. I got to Leeds. One of the reasons I wanted to go to Leeds was because they facilitated a year in South America. 
um, and I was really interested in South American politics. So studying Spanish and politics, I was really I really enjoyed Spanish and I was really interested in politics. Um, and I was really lucky to get my third year at university um, in, in Chile. And I've got a couple of pictures there of, of me with some swimming friends at university and, and, um, and also backpacking. Or I think I've just arrived in Santiago um, in that picture. Um, but, you know, it was wasn't definitely not um, a, a, a wasted year um, because it, it, it facilitated me being able to, to study what I wanted to do. Now I've put on here that I got a 2-2 two -two. Um, and I have to say um, it was through a focus on sport and partying I'm afraid and a lack of focus on study that resulted in me just missing out on a 2-1. The key takeaway here is Girls, ladies, aim for at least a 2-1. It's really tough in the graduate marketplace trying to find a job, particularly in financial services. Um, it's tough going as a graduate with a 2-2. Um, so if there's one piece of advice I can give you, um, it is try and get um, the results you need to get to where you want to get to, because if you don't have the results, um, it is it is it is difficult. Um, I mean, Manchester High, uh, stand you in excellent stead to cope with lots and lots of things in life, but um, that too, too marred the early stages of my career um, or, or presented some real challenge for me. Um, the other thing um, I, I, I would I would also say as well is my father turned around to me and said, what are you, what are you studying Spanish for? What's that going to do? You're not going to become a Spanish teacher. Um, actually, you know, a lot of my friends who did languages, strange enough, have never really used their languages. Lots of people don't. And it wasn't until I was about sort of five years into my career that I realised what that language degree had given me and the time in Chile. It had given me an understanding and an appreciation of what it's like to work um, and to develop um, people and to operate in um, different environments, different cultures, working with different people. It's it instilled into me a, a respect um, and an appreciation um, that I was able to use in the workplace because believe it or not a lot of my colleagues have never lived abroad um, they've never experienced what it's like to to, to live or work or operate in a, in a different environment both culturally um, economically politically um, different legal system there's all these different um, things that, that doing languages and spending time abroad instill in you that you probably don't realize um, are, are building you as a person and are hugely beneficial um, until the time time comes if we can move on please um, so the next slide, this is just sort of life to date, um, life after Leeds. Um, so with my 2-2, I didn't manage to secure a training contract or at least one that would fund me through law school. So I went down to London with a bunch of friends who graduated at the same time and I worked in recruitment and events in London. I have to say that sealed the deal that law was for me because recruitment and events certainly was not. Um, but it bided the time. Um, I actually ended up being quite good at recruitment, earned quite a bit of money and that was, that was uh, able to fund uh, my two years at law school, at least part fund my two years at law school, because um, with a 2-2 I wasn't able to secure a, a training contract that would fund it. However, um, I knew that I had to get my head down at law school. I came back from London to Manchester. I lived with my mum and I went to BPP and it was a great two years. It was tough. It was really hard. All my friends were climbing the career ladder, buying houses, moving in with their boyfriends um, and I wasn't. And that was really hard at 25. Really, really hard. Um, but as I say, law school was good. I worked really hard and as a result, I won a prize at the law school, which um, gave me some work experience, both in, a, in a, um, a barrister's chambers and also in a law firm. And it was off the back um, of that month's, worth month's work experience that I was offered my training contract. Um, and so it all fell neatly into place. Um, but what, you know, what happened during, during um, that time at law school is I suffered 20, 25 plus rejections um, and, and it was tough. Tough. It was really hard, but it enabled me to build up my resilience um, and, and that that period of my life has um, has really prepared me um, for what, you know, sort of what comes um, as, as, as working um, in, in, in real life or, or entering uh, the world of both law and, and, and finance. So I did my training contract. Now, I wanted to be an M&A lawyer. Now, you know all about mergers and acquisitions following uh, Sejal's presentation, but I wanted to be, it was the sexy end of law um, and I really wanted to be an M&A and I joined Leighton's and they put me into private client tax. I was like, 
I could not believe it. Um, and I, I, I thought, you know, I've, I've not even done a module in tax. I wouldn't even know, you know, where to start. Well, you know, six months in and I was totally sold. I absolutely loved um, working with private clients um, and advising them on how to structure and manage their, their personal wealth. Um, and I was very fortunate during that time to be sent on a six month secondment with one of the firm's clients, St James's Place Wealth Management. Um, it was at that point of sort of FTSE 250. Um, I I'm going to I'm going to show myself up here now because Sarah Bates was um, at the time on the board um, and later became um, the, uh, the 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 uh, the chair um, of of the board. But it was it was a relatively reasonably decent sized um, firm, um, but its headquarters were based in Sirencester. Now, for those of you who who don't know the Cotswolds, Sirencester is a little sleepy town. Um, well, it was a sleepy town until St James's Place um, so suddenly it suddenly grew. So I went there for six months, thrown in completely completely at the deep end. I had no idea what financial products were. I didn't know how the financial system worked. You know, I, I was totally immersed in um, in 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 an arena of, 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 of stuff. I just didn't know what any of it meant. But within a couple of weeks, um, I was sort of, you know, picking things up. I had a great team around me supporting me and loved it. So that, that sort of those first 18 months really cemented the fact that private client work was for me. Um, I had to go and do the last month of litigation. Uh, that was the, the, you know, I had to do a, lit a litigation seat and then I, I went back into private client. However, about a year in, um, we're talking sort of financial, uh, the, the, the financial crisis of 2008, eight nine was hitting. A lot of firms were making their private client teams redundant, but also um, a lot of staff redundant. And I took voluntary redundancy. I went back to St James's Place, if you can just go, go on a slide. Um, and this is my career to date. Um, so I joined SJP as, a, as an in-house lawyer in 2010. Um, and what did that mean? Well, it essentially meant that I moved into wealth management. So St James's Place is a wealth management business. It advises what we call in the industry as retail clients. They are private individuals. Um, and we do all the wealth structuring for these individuals um, and that essentially has, has been has been my sort of career to date. I started off um, working in, in small teams giving giving tax advice. Um, I now work in the investment division um, and I manage the teams that distribute all the financial products. So um, we, we invest with um, uh, a lot of the firms that you will have seen in Jordana's and, and Sejal's presentation, um, but we are essentially where they work with institutional clients, so they will be big companies. My role is actually working with the private individuals. So, you know, the, the, the likes of your, you know, your families, um, uh, your, your um, you know, sort of in private individuals who want to to invest um, is, is the work that I now currently do. Um, as you progress um, in, in your career and as I've progressed in my career, I think the sort of the nature of the work changes. You get taken away from the what we call the coal face. You get taken away away from the, the the exciting advice work um, you, you, you moved away from the sort of the technical element of the role and that's what I found most difficult it's taking on um, additional responsibilities that remove you from effectively what you spent your whole life training for um, and, and the business then sort of prepares you for, for the next stage. Um, and I've put on here, you know, I, I've looked beyond 2022. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've been very lucky. I've worked with some fantastic people of SJP. Um, I've had a, you know, I am having a, a great career there. Um, along the way, I've taken on additional responsibilities. Um, why? Um, because I want to give back, uh, because I want to grow and develop, um, because I want to build my network. Um, and so uh, in 2019, um, I joined the Law Society's Women Division. Um, I was surrounded by loads and loads of people who were regulated by, by the FCA. And it was, it was you know, I, I learned an awful lot um, from that. And I was able to take that into, into my role um, working on the Women's Division. Um, for the Law Society, which, you know, I find really interesting. Um, I'm also deeply passionate about um, raising the awareness of so raising financial awareness and making sure that women are, are sufficiently equipped um, to manage their own finances. I went into the workplace not knowing what a pension was. Um, I didn't know what investments were. So I'm, I'm deeply passionate about making sure that, that women in particular are better equipped um, to manage their, their own finances. So I took on the role of a school governor um, uh, in 2020 um, for an all girls 
Royal School based down in London, very similar to Manchester High. Um, I manage their investment committee or I sit on their investment committee. Um, but that for me is sort of giving back um, uh, and, and supporting um, what, what the governors do uh, at that school. Um, I've also joined the Women in Banking and Finance. That's a, a group of senior women within the city um, who come together to sort of network, share best practice, um, support each other. We have a mentoring um, facility um, and, and that's been that's been great um, over the last 12 months to be in, involved in that. And then, you know, what does the future hold for me? Well, you know, I, I, I would hope um, that, you know, at some point in the future there will be um, more senior roles. Um, I've put Ned on here, that's a non-exec director. I'm sure Sarah will talk a little bit about that given given she's she's um, she's taken on those roles. But it's, it's about sort of, you know, I, I want to be able to uh, further develop, continue developing myself both professionally uh, within St James's Place or within the wealth management industry, but also um, I want to continue taking on additional roles um, to sort of to, to give back and, and to, to focus on some of the external um, issues that I'm really passionate and interested in. Next slide, please. So a typical week, um, I've gone a bit off piste. I haven't written down a typical week, but I've just used pictures. Um, really, um, you know, it's busy. Um, I do have a busy week. Um, I don't have really long days now. So, you know, initially early on in my career, my days were quite long. Sometimes they are. It depends what I've got on. But I typically wake up, get up about six o'clock and I'll be working. Um, I might work until three or four o'clock in the afternoon. I might go and pick my daughter up from school and then I might log on again at eight o'clock for a couple of hours to uh, to, to look after and to, 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 to catch up. I generally try and do exercise three or four times a week. So I'll go swimming or I'll go uh, running. Um, uh, but you know I'll wake up I've got emails to check I've got voicemails to check I've got teams messages to check um, my day consists of lot well my week consists of lots of different things um, I have to sort of update my management team I have to update my exec leadership team that I'm a member of so it's quite different to the roles that perhaps Jordana and, and Sage are, are doing right now but that was you know you know what they're doing now I almost sit here with envy because that was the the, the, the part of the career that I loved and and and, and really enjoyed, um, the project work and getting involved uh, with, with lots of different things. You know, now a lot of my responsibility is people management, making sure people are okay, um, catching up on um, or you know sort of working very closely with 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 our HR team. I'm responsible for our people strategy for our division, so um, I, I get heavily involved um, in that. I speak to the press quite a lot, so I'm a, a PR spokesman for our for our business. Um, I have to keep my social media um, accounts up to date, which I do find quite difficult. Um, it's not something I naturally gravitate towards, so that always takes me out of my comfort zone. Um, I have lots of one to ones with people. I do quite a lot of mentoring, so um, I mentor both externally, internally and externally. Um, I spend a lot of time on the phone to IT because I'm rubbish with tech um, and um, I spend a lot of time on my network. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, that is that they're my go to. Um, and, and the more senior you get, um, people say it, the, it, it's not that the lonelier you get, but you there's so much responsibility uh, as, as you climb the, the, the career ladder. You need to find your the people that you can trust, the people that you can lean on, the people that, you know, as I say, will pick you up when you're down and, and take you out for a, for a glass of, of, of champagne when things go things go right. And, and I think I've got that right. Um, and and that that's um, you know a, a very important element of my of my 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 personal and my professional life. If we just move on, um, I often get asked, um, you know, why do I do what I do and why at SJP? I do what I do because I'm passionate about it. I know what my why is. It's taken me a while to find that, but I now know what drives me and why I'm passionate about what I'm passionate about. And I've done quite a lot of work with external coaches and with my manager to 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 sort of get to that point. Um, the other reason is the culture of the organisation. I work with brilliant people. Um, you know, I talked about making mistakes and being supported on the way back up. I work in a really innovative environment, people who think differently and challenge me. Working in wealth management, like the wider financial services industry, you work with such an enormous selection um, and different types of people. And I just love that and I thrive in that environment. So, you know, that's that's why why I do what I do and why at SJP. 
And if I was to leave you with one one thing, um, uh, 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 if we can move on to, to the next slide, I haven't done my five top tips, but I always love this quote from Serena. I don't like to lose anything, yet I've grown most not from victories, but from setbacks. I've had far more setbacks than I've had victories in my life, but Manchester High set me up to deal with them. Um, and I have learned uh, that they're, they're a bit like building blocks. Um, I've learned every time I've, I've, I've fallen over, I've picked myself up stronger um, and, and I would, you know, say the same to you take those little risks and, and as you go through life they might get bigger um, but it, it's how you deal with them and pick yourself up um, that, that really matters so that's me thank you very much excellent gosh thank you very much for that Alex that's absolutely fascinating and I like that you ended that with that quote because one of the things I do is write down a few points as people are speaking and, and I, mean, I kind of wrote resilience um, and sort of courage to pick to pick yourself up and keep going um, facing challenges and when there's adversity rising to that challenge and I I wonder because you mentioned you did a lot of sport and I do wonder whether you've got a sporting image there to finish if it's that sporting mentality, which is you just keep going, you just keep trying, you just get up and you hit the ball again and again and again, um, which I think is brilliant um, because obviously, you know, your career has been fantastic, is fantastic, will continue to be fantastic, even though um, I was actually, I must admit, quite surprised when I saw that you put the 2-2 two -two there because that, that can be a bit of a barrier and you just, you know, climbed over that barrier and went and got yourself a law degree. Um, so it's, again, for the, for the audience out there, it's knowing that, the options are always there and it's just about working hard and trying and finding an alternative route and if it doesn't work out that's okay just carry on and also being true to yourself it's come through very strongly here as well with, with Alex is um, being true to yourself and you know connecting with your values and you've, you've got to sort of live and you've got to work um, in an environment that you feel suits your values and that aligns really so that's something that can take quite a lot of time to find so that's brilliant so thank you so much for for that um, really really interesting talk um, I'm now going to um, introduce our third speaker, um, Sarah, and she's obviously um, had a very full and interesting career as well and was mentioned by Alex. So there's a bit of a connection there between the two of them. And um, so I'd now like to hand over to Sarah, who's going to talk to us about her career and experiences. So thank you very much and over to you. Lovely, thank you. Um, and it's lovely to, to, to be talking here um, and I do you know, here are we sitting comfortably you know, talking about ourselves, whereas I think a lot of the people attending are going to be in the middle of mocks, in the middle of uh, university applications and have had a really tough couple of years, as Sejal said. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm full of admiration and what I'm saying is, is, you know, within the context of I probably had it rather more, rather easier than you did, particularly at this stage of, of your career. So. Um, I, I'll try and give you some some views as to what's happened to me, but I'm I'm absolutely full of admiration for what you're doing, and good luck over the next few months. Um, so if we go um, perhaps um, to the next slide, um, 20 minutes after all of that, really okay. Um, slide after that, please. Um, I I was at school a really long time ago. Um, it was a direct grant grammar school when I was at school. Um, we weren't, I'm not even quite sure what years we were, but anyway, it was upper 3L to the senior six in, in my day. And I, either other, others of you, Sejan and Jordana and Alex have talked about the things that made a difference. And I would say that Mrs Hastings, who was the um, ancient history teacher, I did ancient history A-level, um, was probably the most important educator I had. And it's back to the Manchester High thing. She taught me that if you had the facts and you had done the work, you had as much right to your opinion as anybody else had. And I think that's one of the one of the lessons that I, I was incredibly lucky to be taught. Um, and I do remember that in particular with some of the interesting debates, arguments or however you um, whatever you call them with the boys from Manchester Grammar School, who sometimes had a way with words at that level, that age. So I learned an awful lot. The other two things I think about MHSG was that I'm, I'm still in touch, like um, Alex was talking about and, and Jordana, Jordana and, and Sejal, with maybe 10 people from my class in Upper 3L 
which is really quite something. And we talk about what is common and we are quite a resilient lot. We're quite an independent lot. We have very different paths, careers and trajectories. Um, and we don't know whether we think sometimes it was the traveling that did it to us. You had to sort of cope with all sorts of stuff that went wrong. Um, but there are some common themes about what we got from school. You can see the O levels I did. Um, you can see the A levels that I, I did and to the points and there's Jordana doing double maths and physics and I did um, English, French and ancient history and literature. I do wish um, because I did have to pick it up later. I wish I'd done maths with stats because actually one of the things that I learned a lot about later was was statistics and that that has helped me a lot. I think I did um, manage to use some community service. That was a sort of um, social. Uh, an attempt to be helpful in society. Thursday singers, I've no idea if that's still going. Uh, it is right. OK, the, the, there was a joint drama trip with Manchester Grammar School to the States. Um, I was two years behind Nicholas Heitner doing that, actually. So um, that shows you how old I am. And I did last night go and see his latest production at the Bridge Theatre. So I thought, oh, hasn't he done well? Um, and I thought one of the things, you know, because it was so long ago, I'd, I'd go through the sort of the music that was common at the time. And, and most of you probably won't recognise this, but it was very much prog rock, progressive rock. It was Dark Side of the Moon. It was um, post Woodstock, post the 60s, post Women's Lib, um, post quite a lot of social upheaval in the 60s. Um, and in some ways full of hope. Um, and in terms of work, something that was really different, um, this business of internships, the business of work experience simply wasn't there. And I have all sorts of mixed feelings about it because I think I'm full of admiration for Sejal and Jordana getting those work experience things. It's tough to get them. I think we've got a bit better at making it not just family connections. I hope we've got a bit better. And sometimes, um, and I was interested in, in Sir Giles' perspective, interns have been treated really quite badly. So, you know, I do think, I hope things have got better on that front. Anyway, um, next slide, please. What then happened? Um, I went to Cambridge, I did philosophy and changed to law. And Alex is absolutely right. Her careers teacher was right. Um, I do wonder why I, I changed. Um, I, I should probably have gone on doing philosophy. I was quite good at doing that. Um, and again, I worked in boots and as a temp, um, a temporary typist. Um, activities, theatre, social life, met my husband. Um, I, if you've noticed a bit of disconcerting stuff going on this evening, can I just apologise? Firstly, I think I've just tested positive for COVID. And secondly, well, like most of the rest of you will, my poor husband then went to get some fish for supper because we were going out and he's just had an egg thrown at him. So that was, that, that was that's why things have been a bit, a bit less than um, uh, calm at this end. Um, anyway, music, um, I suppose most of you don't know who Prickle Haram was, but I, I remember the punt bit because actually after that sort of period of optimism or, or something, revolution in the 70s, by the end of the 70s, the UK was in the most terrible state. And you, you know, you probably won't realise this, but you know, Sex Pistols wrote Anarchy in the UK. It's that's how it felt. And it was a really, it was a turbulent time. Um, I graduated in 80 and there were no jobs going anywhere else. Um, so it was you know, somebody said, to pick up Sejal's point, well, if you enjoy research and you enjoy analysis, you could try being an, an analyst in the city. So that's how I ended up there. And, you know, my dad was taught history at Salford University. My mum was a medical librarian at Widdenshaw Hospital. So this was a bit of a, a switch for me. So I started off in broking and then I moved into investment management, uh, which is where I've um, stayed for the rest of my career. So I'm going to say a bit about what that what that is. And again, thanks for that lovely slide, Sejal, with with all those boxes in. 
Uh, but if you could possibly move to the next slide, that would be great. So investment management, um, basically investing money as, as a business, as entities, it's investing money for other people um, and trying to make returns to fund the activities for other people. Um, and as Sejal said, um, that, you know, the industry develops as a source of capital for companies um, providing um, share capital, providing loans. And so we, we start off by, and as Jordana said, we start off by trying to invest in things that will produce a return, but we're also needed to provide capital. The only investors in the UK, um, the church, the crown, charities, invested land and gold and buildings. And actually there was an extraordinary change, and I'm, I'm slightly off my territory here, in the 19th century, when structures changed to facilitate the raising of money, if you like, during the Industrial Revolution to, to provide that, you know, those sources of capital um, and the rap rapid change in the UK economy and elsewhere that happened at that time. But when I started, a lot of investment was very institutional. Um, it would have been pension funds, insurance companies, paying out salaries, uh, paying out pensions. But now in the UK, and it's different in other countries, Alex is right, you know, we can be a bit UK centric. Um, a lot of, lot more savings in the UK is down to individuals. Savings isn't nearly as institutional as it was. It's become much more individual and individuals are, across the spectrum are having to provide more for their own financial future. In many ways, things are less secure for individuals. So that's what it is. Um, if you could turn to the next slide, possibly. Who does it? All sorts of organisations in the UK, from big to small. And this is taking Sejal's block of, and box and sort of breaking it down. And these may have be firms that you see advertising. Um, most of these firms offer graduate trainee schemes and internships. Um, BlackRock, great big, enormous worldwide firm, as is Fidelity. I put in Aberdeen because it's a bit of a silly name, really. It's a bit of corporate rebranding that has uh, caused a bit of controversy, but the controversy itself has um, uh, given rise to brand awareness. And then those are the asset management firms. They're the wealth management firms which um, Alex was talking about. And indeed, Alex and I used to work together. And I remember Annabelle arriving, actually, or certainly being brought into the office at a very early stage. Um, I also remember, Annabelle, not very long. You swam across the channel, didn't you? I mean, <laughs> you know, this swimming bit was quite serious. Um, and of course, obviously, individuals manage their own money. Um, and some of you, some of people in the... Um, audience, some of the par your parents may do this for themselves um, through uh, the development of um, platforms that allow you to do this. Again, that's something that's changed radically in the last 20, 30 years. Um, but there are still some very big pension schemes um, and they are not for profit businesses. They, they are making money for pensioners. They're getting returns for pensioners. Um, the biggest is the university scheme, there's the mine workers scheme, there's the Greater Manchester Pension Scheme. So around you, there are very different sorts of organisations owned in different ways, investing money in the UK. So that's who does it. Um, why do it, which is the next slide. Actually, it's absolutely fascinating. That's why, you know, people have talked about what their passion is. There's this extraordinary world around you. You know, why did Facebook share price drop 25% in the last couple of days? Um, what's going on? Is the tech bubble going to persist? Um, you know, what, what's going on in the UK economy? It, it, it's absolutely riveting. Um, how much changes? How much is staying the same? Uh, there's a lovely phrase in investment, which is um, the most uh, dangerous words in the English language are, it's different this time. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating. You've also got extraordinary access. I've had conversations with amazing people, running companies, running businesses, trying to raise money. Um, and that, that's a privilege, actually. 
Um, I remember being driven around Yorkshire by Sir Ken Morrison um, of the supermarket chain in his light blue Mercedes um, at quite an early, early age. Um, and I have met some extraordinarily impressive people um, over the years. Um, qualities that you need. It, you do need to be able to stand back. You do need to have independent views. You do need judgment. You do need to know when not to follow the crowd. You need to have that sort of train of independent thought. And this is oversimplifying, but if you know either more or something different from other people, you may have an advantage. You also have to be acutely aware that everybody else is trying to out decide you at the same time. So you, you have to think, hold on, do they know something I don't know? You know, what, what, what is going on out there? And it can be brutal because you can be wrong um, and you can you can very quickly see that you're wrong. And one of the lessons that certainly I've learned is if you are wrong, you need to recognise re that really quickly, admit it and move on. Um, and in terms of what you're doing, and I think this picks up what Jordana said, um, the results do actually help pension funds. There is, you know, the money is needed, the returns are needed. This makes individuals more secure. It makes charities able to do what their charitable purpose is, and it may make gains for you as well. So it, it's an extraordinary privilege, and I've seen extraordinary things over the last 40 years, for heaven's sakes. OK, next slide, please, please. Um, so where did I go? I, I joined the graduate scheme at Stockbrokers. It was very early days. Um, there were only two of us. I don't think they quite knew what to do with us, really. It was no, it was quite an eccentric thing to do. I then went over to the investment management side. Um, I did do an MBA um, part time at the London Business School. That was tough, actually. Three years doing studying part time and holding a job down. Um, I went to the investment management team at Invesco and I think another Manchester High School tray I wanted to pull out. I, you know, I, I've ended up, sounds perhaps a bit more, you know, a bit, bit sort of self-satisfied, it's not. I've ended up being in charge of things or running things, always slightly to my surprise. But generally, because I've been a, the person who said, oh, come on, let's get on with this. Let's come up with an answer to this. Let's come up with a solution. The next three things we could do are this. So I think there's that sort of, hold on, there's a problem. Let's address it. Let's solve it, which I think is certainly something that um, came from came from school. You know, come on, we, we can do this. It's uh, we, we, we can come to an answer here. Um, our daughter was born in 93. Um, moving on swiftly, she also went to Imperial. Um, she did uh, Earth Sciences. Um, it's now, I was, Alex and I were changing notes, she's doing a postdoc um, in uh, planetary science. Um, so uh, she's, she's chosen really rather a, a, a different career to me. Um, but that, that's, that's wonderful, that's great. I understand some of what she does. Um, I was made redundant in 03. I wrote Change Tack and then I spoke to Lucy who said actually people to know, need to know things go wrong. Um, I survived seven CEOs and I didn't survive the eighth. Um, so I, um, I wrote Change Tack and now I was made redundant. It was fine. I then decided that if rather than walk into another organisation, I'd create my own set of activities which gave me more autonomy gave me more um, ability to direct uh, what I wanted to do. I did end up being chair of a Russian property company. It was a hell of a mistake, but the Russian did come in handy. So <laughs> I can read the name of Russian underground stations. Um, you know, not a lot more than that, but it, but it has had its uses. Uh, I've been a non-exec director for a lot of investment companies and um, for St James's Place, where I eventually became chair, and I have been, one, I, you know, I'm one of the few chairs of FTSE 100 companies who are women, um, which is just a shocker, really. It's absolutely absurd there are so few of us in the, this position, or in that position. Okay, um, and now um, next slide, please. The end. 
I, you know, I have I have rushed through a bit, but you have put up with um, 20 minutes of, you know, from everybody else and time moves on. Um, I've ended up chairing quite a few things still. I'm interested in the way that different ownership structures, are you owned by shareholders? Are you owned by your employees? I'm interested in the way that those structures work and how they make people behave and um, whether whether behave, people behave differently. I'm actually really interested in, and this comes from SJP, but also the John Lewis partnership, what structures actually deliver really good service to customers? What works? What makes people listen to customers? So that's been a sort of persistent thing. And in financial services, we can get far too far away from our customers. And just in case they're um, sort of not, um, you know, the, 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 this is, um, you know, sort of strange connections. Um, I have been a customer of Evercore, um, which the Jal is going to, and they were extremely impressive and very, very helpful. And in Jordana's world, actually, a number of the things I'm currently involved in are also really major investors in um, infrastructure. Um, so I, I know a bit of both of your worlds and I, uh, they're, they're fascinating. Um, the other thing I did uh, in 2015 is with three other people co-found the diversity project because we were so horrified by how few women there were still in what in, in, in our um, sector. Um, and that's developed all sorts of work streams. There's uh, one called Talk About Black, which is trying to support black British people in the investment and savings sector. There's an early career bit. You know, the, the things that Jordana and Sejal obviously got to grips with, trying to expand that knowledge so other people know how you go about getting into financial services. Um, and there's a number of other things we've done, the, the Returners programme, the Gender programme, as well as the um, LGBTQ plus programmes to, to try and make our sector more diverse. Current issues in investment, climate change is a really big thing. If we own shares, what do we do to encourage the companies in which we invest to transition to a net zero economy? And um, we're in some ways, we're at the first, in the UK regulatory structure, we're right at the, the, the sharp edge of this at the moment, um, developing net zero uh, strategies. Diversity and inclusion, the other issues are is the tech bubble. But going back to something Alex said, one of the other challenges is how do we develop good pensions, particularly for women who tend to work part time, sadly still tend to be lower paid. And the Chartered Insurance Institute, which is this link, has done some really good work on the points at which women are particularly vulnerable to some of the worst aspects of our economic structure. And again, thinking about, it's a point Jordana made, thinking about improving your own financial self, self-sufficiency, reliance, resilience is something that you need to think about um, as you go through. Um, my day is very varied. Today, I took the um, diversity project. I had a remuneration committee, which is talking about how much people are paid. How do we assess that? How does that work? Um, I talked to somebody about our climate change programme, and then I had a couple of really quite knotty problems in, in my work. Sometimes I get landed with some stuff rather late at night um, and, uh, you know, somebody says somebody's raised this issue. What are you going to do about it? And I think I'm oh, good. Right. OK, what do we do? And just to go back to the music, which will probably make you laugh. Um, my, my current listening, Leonard Cohen, David Barry, still the Bach cello suites, Stan Getz and Al Green. So that's, you know, just I hope a bit of a window into the asset, into the investment management bit as I've seen it, um, and a bit of a window into how that I've linked it links back to the experience that I had at Manchester High School. So thank you for listening.
Wow, that's fascinating. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and linking all the things together and thinking back, you know, I think you said your school something like 19, in the 70s. And yes, I was I was also in the school in, in the 70s. And I remember that time very well, um, very, very well indeed, being at a comprehensive in London in 1970. Wasn't a lot of schooling going on. I seem to remember a lot of strikes, but I, that was great for me. Um, but Linking things together is brilliant. And, you know, Sage, I'll said it's a huge industry, but a very small world. And there are connections between all of you, which is which is fantastic. It's, you know, you do get to know people in the industry, even though it's really big with all these different divergent arms. Um, and I liked your comment about the Russian uh, language and how it came in. And particularly when you said about reading the tube, um, the underground stations, I, I did go once to, to Moscow and St. Petersburg and, it, and I knew I didn't know the language, but it just didn't occur to me that the signs for the train stops would be in Russian. And I could only do it by counting how many stops I needed to go. And I did miss that once and got off at the wrong stop and it was it was terrible. Um, so, yeah, if you're going to go to Russia, it's really good to have a few key words, I think. And um, that was my fault. Um, so and then late nights, uh, it's just funnily you mentioning that you get these messages late at night. and You've got to sort of sort something out. And I start, we started with Sejar having that, you know, day that ends at 2 a.m. And me thinking, oh, gosh, that's that's quite quite a lot. But it sounds like that, you know, the job doesn't end at five o'clock and if something comes up you've got to deal with it but you know that's what makes it exciting as well I guess and having that sort of sense of control of what's going on so four really really different um, experiences um, and stages of career and that's really what what the purpose of this this event is these types of events are is to really show that trajectory and for some young people watching that might seem like a long way away but it's really good to know that, you know, things go on, you keep learning, you keep changing, you keep developing, things might not go well, you pick yourself up and the skills and the friends that you get from Manchester High will be with you all the way. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I, it's been absolutely fascinating and really, really interesting. Um, and I'm going to now move actually to um, Kerry Chisnell, Mrs Chisnell, um, who is, um, as I say, lead of economics, careers teacher. And she's just going to talk us through just a couple of courses at university as we've heard there are a million different ways you can get into this and when you get to this stage of your development audience we'll work with you on this but here are just a few examples from from Kerry so over to you Kerry thank you Thank you. It was so lovely to hear from all of you and say, Joel, uh, to hear about so one of your highlights was uh, the Disneyland Paris trip. You'd be pleased to hear I'm currently organising next year's. So I think it's probably the 15th or 16th. And I think, Jordana, I took your older sister uh, to Disneyland Paris as well. So it's, it's, it's an institution within the school, I think. And uh, your pictures are still on the wall outside W1, say, Joel. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, as I say, I'm in charge of economics and my background is I did a business and management degree and I didn't know what to do really um, after doing my A-levels. And it's really interesting to hear all the speakers talk about it's so important you do things that you enjoy. And I think that's what I say all the time in my careers um, interviews that I have with the students at Manchester High. Um, you'll be pleased to hear, Alex, we do do pension advice um, with the with the students. They have two, two sessions with myself and my colleague and we do a whole session session about what pensions are, um, debt, credit cards, payday loans, because we feel it's a really important part of our wellbeing session that the girls go out into the world of work knowing what these are as well. So I think uh, Sage will have experienced those as well, as well, along with their A-level studies as well. Um, but again, for me, it's, it's so important to see about the different ways you can enter this profession. Um, I almost became an accountant before I went into teaching, believe it or not, and I can remember um, um, first day in my lectures, 150 people on my course um, having a lecture about finance and everyone going, oh, this is a bit boring. And the lecturer saying, you'll all end up in finance. Um, and he was correct, actually. There was just me, the lone teacher who went in to do a PGCE, but I almost, almost took the step as well. If I could have the next slide, please. So I just wanted to show there's different ways and in, routes into um, the world of finance and investment banking. So just going um, on to UCAS, so if I talk about degree apprenticeships, first of all, because obviously you can do an undergraduate route into finance, but also there are so many opportunities now with degree apprenticeships. So just typing the word finance into UCAS, you can see already on the screen, the 1500 opportunities to do degree apprenticeships. And on the screen, you can see one at Morrison's and the government itself. Um, we have students taking this route from Manchester High. One of our old girls 
I, it's always really strange to call you an old girl because you're not really old girls at all. Um, a few years ago, I think it was a year before you, Sajel, Jennifer Escott. So she's currently do, doing an apprenticeship with um, Ernst & Young in Manchester. Um, and she was actually nominated for um, Apprentice of the Year a couple of years ago. She's made such an impact as well. But this is just one way if you feel that university is not for you or you want to earn while you learn if you're concerned about getting into student debts as well. So lots and lots of opportunities um, to enter this world as well. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so again, you've talked about JP Morgan, some of the investment banks as well. Um, again, you can actually approach them directly to, uh, to apply for degree apprenticeships. This is a financial services one as well. Um, I can't remember, Sajal, if you were, did you apply for some of these? I can't quite remember if you went through the route. No, so you went straight through the university route as well. So again, different routes into this um, if you don't feel that university is for you. Next slide, please. So I did do some searching on UCAS, typed in, as you can see, finance and investment banking, and I've pulled together some um, degrees to show you if you want to do the, the university route. So one that you can see on the on the screen is Bangor University, as uh, so they do a banking and finance, a three year um, BSc honours. And in this example, they, they use UCAS points. So 80 to 120. So again, looking at around three Bs to enter this course as well. What's really interesting that when I did my research into this. Um, I know a lot of the, the, the guest speakers did A-level maths, but you don't actually have to have A-level maths. And I'm asked constantly about that. Do I need to do A-level maths? And the answer is no. Um, the courses I'm going to show you, none of them require A-level maths. Um, and again, I would also say we've had students who've done a degree in music go into this this area as well. It's about the passion that you have and the skills that you develop at your time studying as well. If we go to the next slide, please. So I'm a big advocate for Manchester University and I know it's on the doorstep. A lot of the, the students go past it and it's it's not considered, but it's one of the top universities. And this is just one course that they offer. They do actually offer over six courses to do with accounting and finance or management accountancy as well. Um, typically three A's for a course at Manchester University. Um, please don't discount Manchester or Salford or Manchester Met or the universities on your doorstep. Uh, some fantastic courses there. My own son actually, he wants to go to Manchester to do um, geography. I tried to persuade him to do some sort of business or economics, but I failed on that as well. But again, it's what he's passionate about and uh, where he wants to go as well. So again, lots and lots of um, opportunities on your doorstep. Um, the school is really, really lucky that we do have links with Manchester University um, and hopefully when we come through the pandemic, we can really renew our visits to the university where we've been to um, lectures there um, to take students to actually a wide range of, of, of topics there. So again, Manchester is a really good place if you want to stay close to home. Um, next slide, please. So again, um, Birmingham, again, one of the things we talk to the, the students about is the different types of university. So Birmingham is a campus university, which is very, very different feel to Manchester or, or other places that you might visit. So again, another accounting and finance course here that I found. Um, this one again was three A's. Um, Birmingham, they do talk about the fact that they are very highly ranked in terms of um, top employers and a lot of the courses that you can do, you do have exemptions if you want to go into accountancy and finance for some of the, the prof professional qualifications that you need to do as well. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that was last one. I thought I had another one. Um, in the careers department, um, we are available to, to help with your questions as well. Um, we have lots of one to one interviews with you throughout your time at Manchester High and we're, we're freely available for you to actually drop in to book appointments if you really do not know what you want to do as a career. I didn't I didn't know what I wanted to do. I think that's why I ended up doing a business management degree because it covered so many different things from economics to um, production operations management. Again, I was one of the only women on the course surrounded by men, um, did the accountancy options, marketing, ethics. I'm very, very passionate in the course that we teach at Manchester High, a, a, a large section about ethical business and, and how economics can make a difference. So if there's any questions, I think I'm going to pass back to, to Sarah now. OK, thank you.
Excellent. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Mrs Chisnell. Really, really useful, just array of, of, of options. And that was just for the finance and accounting, but there are so many different routes into this profession. So you don't have to do that at all. Um, but there are a full range of courses um, in that area um, that, that you can you can get into and also apprenticeships and apprenticeship degrees. And increasingly, um, employers are very keen to have um, you know students who've had work experience, whether it's internships, work experience, um, maybe a study year, in, uh, sorry, an employment year in the middle of your degree. They really like to take students who've got some experience as well. I mean, increasingly, you can do the sort of apprenticeship route where you go straight into work and you're learning when you're working as well. So, um, got a, just a couple of questions before we finish up. Um, and there was one question quite early on about about courses, um, get you know, university courses. And we've had a bit of an intro there from Mrs. Chisnell. And I think when it comes to the time to really choose those options. We do quite a lot of work. We have a really good programme of higher ed advice for our students and quite intensive and closely working with the students. But up until that point, you can always make an appointment with the careers department um, to um, you know, talk, talk about options that you might be interested in. But we, we do a lot on helping students find university courses. And ultimately, you've got to find the course that suits you in terms of your grade profile, the modules that you that look interesting, um, the required the subjects you do and do you meet the requirements for that course? And then you can also look at what opportunities that university course might provide for you in terms of networking opportunities or career links and um, inter internship things, those sorts of things. There are lots and lots of things, factors to consider, but we'll, we'll work closely with students on that um, when the time comes. Um, we, we have got a question um, actually for Alex from from somebody. So, Alex, if you're if you're if you can prepare to answer, just asking you about whether you might consider sitting up on your own, your own wealth management company. Is it a very difficult thing to do to, to sort of be a pioneer and go out there and set up your own company? What, what would you say about that? So I think it's, it's a great question because um, <clears throat> the advice market um, is a very sort of under resourced area of the industry. Um, St James's Place is an interesting um, an interesting firm because St James's Place uh, distribution arm, so so effectively the salespeople of my or the organisation I work with, are all self-employed financial advisors running their own businesses. So I actually work on a daily basis with two and a half thousand entrepreneurs running their own businesses. Have I ever been tempted to jump the fence and become a partner? Um, yeah, I have. I mean, absolutely. You know, running, running, running your own business, um, helping people, working with families. You know, Sarah, Sarah said it's a really privileged role. Um, you know, whether you're dealing with corporates and big institutions or you're dealing with small, um, smaller families, um, you are entrusted with some really, really interesting, um, important, quite sensitive information. Um, and so it, it is a fascinating job that couple that with the excitement of running your own business and training people um, and, 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 and the like. Yeah, you know, I, I'm tempted. I, I would be tempted. However, um, I have to confess, um, I've always preferred to stay on the employed side. Um, uh, and, and that's um, through personal experience and um, when I was at law school did I become a barrister or a solicitor I chose to become a solicitor because I didn't want to work for myself at that point point. Um, and I think to some extent there is the net the element of, of the financial security um, that, that, that working in um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a business you know having having a job an employed job um, that, that has many attractions particularly you know sort of I'm I've got financial commitments now um, that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty wedded to. Um, but there are lots of, you know, we've got an increasing number, not enough, and we need more, but about 13% of our partnership, so of the two and a half thousand entrepreneurs I was talking about, um, about 13% of them are women. It's not enough, um, you know, and, 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 and believe it or not, you know, women's wealth, so, you know, the likes of us, our investable wealth is going to increase at a much faster rate than men's over the next five, 10, 15 years. And the reality is um, there's going to be huge opportunities for, for, for advisors who are female. Um, uh, you know, you bring we bring a different set of qualities um, and and 
um, a different set of skills to the table that some of our, our male counterparts do. So I'm, I'm a huge advocate. Um, I just haven't, I perhaps haven't walked the walk in that respect, um, but there's certainly a huge amount of opportunity um, to do so. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that does actually sort of lead a little, a little bit, I think, into the into a next and possibly final question, just in terms of financial security and why people make the decisions they do as to whether they're going to be entrepreneurs and independent or perhaps work for somebody else. Um, and also thinking about, you know, women's financial competence and security and um, financial literacy, if you like. Um, and I must admit, so there's a question about pensions and I must admit it's only very recently that I have become interested in finances and my financial future. It's suddenly slightly more to the fore um, and for various personal reasons it's also become a bit more interesting to me, a bit more relevant. So so the final question and I guess I would ask, I think, um, I mean, say, do you know what, I'm going to ask you to have a go at this question. You may well be able to answer it. If I, if I could just kind of go to all four speakers in the order in which you spoke and maybe the, a, a, a short answer. Um, we've got a question. Why is it commonly popular for pensioners to invest? So, Sejal, if you want to unmute yourself and, and have a think about that. Um, because they can, I, I honestly don't know the answer myself, but um, maybe because they can, if they can create a return on their money, then that's that's going to benefit them at that stage. But I guess the other three speakers might, might know the answer. I was muted. Um, so w w why is it? Why is it common for, for pensioners to invest? So I, I mean, I think as as Sejal said, it's you know they've they've saved up money uh, through their their lifetime, um, and to make sure you know that their, their pot of money grows. If you invest it into something, you will it will grow. That. Uh, Alex, are you, are you? I'm unmuted. Excellent. Yeah, off you oh, go. I'm ready to go. OK, yeah. Um, yeah. so why do, why do pensioners take advice? Well, if we think about it, um, you know, you become a pensioner. That's generally at the point at which you retire. So it's it's the point at which you stop earning. Potentially you're, you're not earning money. You're not in the accumulation, what we call the accumulation phase of your life. And so the reason why, you know, so the average age of somebody taking investment advice is probably later on in life is because they suddenly realise that they're not going to be earning. Um, a, 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 you know, a, a regular salary. And so therefore, you know, they suddenly think, right, gosh, I've been investing all these years or, or probably haven't really even taken much notice in terms of, of investing all these years. The, the employer might have been making contributions. They have been making contributions. They may not have taken any notice of the portfolio uh, that their pension was invested in. And at the point at which you retire, that's what you rely on traditionally. Um, pensions is an interesting one. Uh, because I would challenge whether, you know, pensions are, are going, there's been a lot of changes over recent years. Um, and, and I am of the view we, we need to start sort of trying to change the narrative around what is going to fund retirement in the future. Because gone are the days of what many of our parents will be benefiting, benefiting from now, which is something called final salary um, or, or defined benefit. Um, uh, you, you're now quite sort of heavily limited into what you can invest in pensions and get the tax relief. So there's there's been a huge number of changes over the last sort of about 15, 20 years. Um, and if you're not taking advice until you're at pensionable age, well, that's a perilous position to be in. Um, and, you know, starting the workforce, knowing what a pension is, is really important. Starting off your working life, understanding the importance of understanding where your pension is invested is even better. So, um, yeah, that, that, that would be my answer. Quite long winded, but. No, that's that's really useful. Thank you. Um, and if I can just finally hand over to um, Sarah. Um, I think. 
I think you see pensioners investing for the reasons people have talked about. I mean, in general, as you come through your 20s and 30s, you'll be paying down student debt. You might be getting involved. You used to get, get involved in the housing market. Perhaps, perhaps not. You have other financial commitments. Um, kids, you know, you, you probably aren't thinking about it. And then as you get later on, you suddenly think, ah, I'm going to have to rely on my savings or that bit of my savings called pensions. Um, to Alex's point, you know, we, we call it pensions. It's probably savings. And you probably observe, therefore, that people in their 50s and 60s start talking about investment rather more. And for a lot of people, they are relying on those investments. I think, as I said, once upon a time, 30, 40 years ago, you'd rely on your company, you'd rely on uh, to provide a pension, and that doesn't happen anymore. However, can't miss the opportunity to remind those of you who aren't aware, and I'm sure you all are, about compound interest. Um, the longer you go on saving for, the more it's worth at the end of the day. And actually, um, the people who really start to think about these things earlier you know, do put themselves at an advantage if they possibly possibly can scrape a bit of money you know, at the end of the month to put into a savings product. It will, it's better if you start that earlier. But that's the end of my you know, homily, I guess. Right, OK, so I think that brings us to the end of what's been a really fascinating um, evening. Um, I've certainly learnt quite a few things myself and I hope all of you have learnt something out there and perhaps even speakers from each other. And it's great to have our ex-pupils back. We really, really do appreciate that you've given up so much of your time this evening and your expertise and your advice. Um, I'm sure that everyone's taken something away from this. And thank you to our uh, audience as well and for your questions. And as you can hopefully see on the screen, if there are some questions that you want answered that weren't answered tonight, please just do email development. Um, the uh, email address is up there and uh, we'll be able to get those questions answered. But uh, absolutely, financial um, know-how is really, really important. And so I really am very grateful to these um, guest speakers for showing us the way on that and uh, getting us thinking about these things young. Um, starting early. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to say goodnight to everybody and wish you a very good evening and please do make sure that you attend our next Insight Into, which is coming up very soon. It's on dentistry towards the end of this month. Um, I believe the date is the 24th of February. So if you're interested in dentistry, then please do sign up for that one. Um, and once again, thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Goodbye, everybody.